Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're calling from. Welcome to our webinar. Again, this is a webinar featuring a team from HVR and Wearscape. I'm really, we're really excited to have you here today. So the webinar is Accelerate Your Data Warehouse Project, and we're really excited to bring you this joint webinar. Um, together, we're going to talk today about how our solution brings automation and rapid data integration to your data infrastructure efforts, and how our solutions help accelerate the delivery of real-time data to business. And the purpose of today's webinar event is to talk in more detail about our solutions. So before we dive in, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Now we've done a sound check, and please know that everyone on the call is on mute. Now that doesn't mean that you won't have a platform to ask questions. I think most of you have done a go-to webinar event before, but if you haven't, please know there is a questions box um, in the control panel. Feel free at any time to type in a question, and then we will ask your question at the end of the webinar. All right, but everyone is ready to get started. So I'd like to introduce to you, to you today your host. Really excited to introduce Douglas or Doug Barrett. He's a senior solutions architect with Wearscape. And he's joining us today with over 20 years of experience in helping organizations build data warehouses. In fact, at Wearscape, he's actually developed a solution that has significantly reduced risk by applying automation, agility, and modeling, and has been able to help facilitate speed and communication for data warehousing pro projects. Prior to Wearscape, he has also been um, at Microsoft in their consulting services division. Now, Doug is calling in today from Portland, Oregon, and he says that where you need to love rain and beer. And so he's actually been there for eight years and is quite enjoying it. And you probably, if you haven't seen Ted before, he, he uh, I mean Ted, sorry, Doug before, he often speaks at TechEd, SQL Saturdays, and TDWI conferences. So again, welcome, Doug. And then we also have Paul Spitaleri of HVR. He is a senior solutions architect with an extensive background in data replication technology. He's also been um, in the industry for quite some time, um, over 20 years of experience. Um, he's really experienced with data replication, data integration, and real-time change data capture. And before HVR, uh, Paul has played a huge role in helping products such as Shareplex and Golden Gate launch and de be developed. Now, Paul is actually on the opposite coast. He's on the East Coast, or some might say the right coast, depending on where you're from. Um, and he is a huge a uh, hockey player, he coaches hockey, and big fan of hockey. So if hockey fans out there, talk to Paul, user guy. So I'm gonna go over the agenda before our host um, starts talking about their piece. So we're gonna have Doug go first. He um, is gonna talk about Wearscape. And for those who aren't familiar with Wearscape, this is an opportunity to understand what is data warehouse automation. And, and he's gonna talk about how Wearscape automates the design, development, deployment, and operation of the data warehouse infrastructure. And then Paul is gonna talk about HVR, what it is for those who aren't familiar, and what data replication technology can offer organizations. And then in the next section, Doug and Paul will talk about how HVR and Wearscape can together help accelerate your data warehouse projects. And again, for those on the call, if you're embarking on a project, this is a really key time to listen in and see how these two technologies work together. And um, Doug will be leading us through a demo as well. And then at the end, which is about the last 10 minutes of the call, we'll be having a Q&A. All right, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Doug and he can take it from there. Thank you all. Ah, excellent. Right, well, first of all, I'd like to say how excited I am about this partnership. It really, uh, this partnership with HVR really allows us to extend Wearscape solutions. It adds the ability to load data in real time or more near real time uh, loading from source. It allows us to do better audit tracking of data from source. And it allows us to better access data in applications like SAP or Salesforce. So I'm really excited about how HVR extends uh, a Wearscape solution. 
for those of you that don't know Wearscape, we're kind of the preeminent uh, data warehouse automation company. So data warehouse automation is all about automating the design, the development, the documentation, the deployment, and the operations of a data warehouse. Data warehouse automation is all about productivity. It's all about removing 80 to 90% of the, the manual effort in building a data warehouse. And productivity equals agility. Product, agility is really key to the success of a data warehouse. Agility boils down to collaboration with the business and iteration so that we can work through uh, a project and adapt the project during the project to a better understanding of the data and a better understanding of the requirements. And that's really important because often when we're working with the business, the business don't know what they need until they see it. And by iterating through a project, iterating through a design uh, that's actually built using Wearscape, then they can see what, what data is available and how it can be applied. So we've been doing this um, for a fairly long time. We've been um, automating projects for, for getting on for 20 years, and we've got around 700 customers. And talking of customers, we have, you can see there's a selection up on the, on the board here. We've got some very large organizations. We've got some very small organizations. But the organizations that we work with uh, are across all industries. As you can see, we've got retailers like Costco. We've got financial services. We've got colleges. Uh, we have um, retailers. We've got all sorts in there. Uh, and some of the very large organizations might have a team of 100 developers working with Wearscape to build out the data warehouse. We might be loading terabytes of data a day. But we also have smaller organizations like my local community college. They have one part-time guy using Wearscape to build a, customer, uh, a student retention data mart on SQL Server. So it really does scale up, scale down, and it, and it doesn't matter what industry it's applied to. All of these organizations needed the ability to be more productive, uh, and to be agile in delivery of data warehouse projects. Now, the reason that data warehouse projects um, take so long is that it's a labor-intensive process to build a data warehouse using a traditional suite of tools. One of our customers recently compared how they use their, their modern ETL tool against Wearscape. And to build a dimension table, they, they found that they were doing 28 development steps in their ETL tool against three in Wearscape. The rest of it could be automated. And really, when you think about it, you want that automation because it applies standardization. Building a type two dimension, for example, should be the same the next time you build a type two dimension, then the next time, and the next time. Everything should be the same about it, the code pattern, the, the housekeeping columns, the start and end dates, should all be consistent, should be the same. And that's what automation does. It, it allows us to automate the development process, but it also allows us to standardize the development process as well. So what we get is much more standardized output. And that's really, really handy because when it comes to support, we don't want there to be much in the way of variations. We don't have to want to understand how each developer codes a certain way in order to support their code. It doesn't matter who's driving the keyboard when they're using Wearscape, they get the same code at the end of it. It also allows us to, um, uh, to be, or um, the traditional way, doesn't allow us to be fast enough to be agile. Working, the business, we, working with the business, we need a cadence of change that allows us to remain engaged with the business. Uh, if it takes a, a few days or a few weeks to make a change based on some input from the business, the business is going to lose focus and lose that engagement. We need something that's a lot faster to maintain that engagement with the business. And because, well, usually when we go into an organization and we ask, so what's your documentation look like for the data warehouse? Um, and everybody looks a bit sheepish and looks at each other and looks at their shoes, because usually there isn't very good documentation. If there's documentation at all, it's often out of date. Now, by using uh, an automation tool, 
we get documentation. Without that, we have to rely on tribal knowledge. We have to uh, rely on what's in people's heads to understand how something was built and how it should be supported and how it all hangs together. And all of this leads to frustration. The business wants access to data as soon as possible. They want access to the data now, but IT takes time to get it right and it takes too long to get it right. And so there's this frustration between business and between IT uh, and you know, that's a problem that we want to solve with automation. So automation, data warehouse automation, uh, solves these problems by trying to eliminate a lot of this uh, labor intensive, we call it donkey work of the data warehouse. Now it does this by using metadata and code patterns and design patterns. And data warehousing is riddled with patterns and we'll see more about that in a minute. But we want the code to be the same um, for, the, for a similar object, to make it easier to support, to make it quicker to build. Um, and we want to apply best practices as we do that. Now we're using code patterns that have been developed uh, against each target platform to apply the best practices of that platform, as well as the best practices of um, the data warehouse processing that we're trying to apply. And so that just happens by using the tool. And this reduces the complexity, it reduces the time it takes to use new platforms or to bring people up to speed. We can make fairly average coders look like superstars using Wearscape because a lot of the output is done for them. They just have to worry about little snippets which are applying specific business rules. And the overall code pattern is applied over the top of that to make it quick and easy to, to build a lot of code very, very rapidly within the data warehouse. And all of this allows us to be much more reactive, a lot more agile as we work with the business. And that's the key to, to successful business, a successful project, particularly as we're working in the business layer uh, or the semantic layer of a data warehouse. And of course, delivering projects faster means that they're delivered with less cost as well. So as we have a look at a data warehouse, there's patterns everywhere. There's patterns in loading data, there's patterns in storing data, there's patterns to apply surrogate keys, to generate hash keys, there's indexing patterns, there's star schema patterns, there's uh, third normal form design patterns, there's data vault patterns, and there's patterns that are specific to different target platforms. Like do we do a um, CTAS, a create table, a select to process data and persist data? Or do we use a merge statement or an insert statement or an update statement? All of these patterns are built into the tool as, as it applies code generation and table management within a, within a target platform. Uh, and so Wearscape really tries to leverage <coughs> all of these patterns in order to <coughs> automate the development. Now, if we have a look at a conventional way of building a data warehouse, these are the steps that we've identified uh, in how you'd build a data warehouse, starting at the bottom with requirements gathering, looking at source data, profiling source data, defining a target model, designing ETL, building ETL, testing ETL, managing versions, managing workflow, managing deployments, and so on. And as you scan up the left-hand side of that, that staircase, <clears throat> we can see there's usually a suite of tools that we use as we try and deliver those projects. There's ETL tools, modeling tools, profiling tools, and whatnot. And each one of those tools is not particularly well integrated with the next. And so there's often a handover between these steps. Uh, and those handovers are actually you know, slow down the, the development process, usually a different set of skills in each, in each tool, maybe a different set of people as well. And this is what slows down development, but it also makes changes very, very hard. Because if I decide, hey, you know, we need to change the, the target model to cope with a better understanding of the data, for example, often I have to come down to the design, change the design, update the ETL mapping, go back and redevelop the ETL, test against the, the, uh, the mapping, and so on. It's a complicated and, and relatively um, inefficient way of developing and making changes. We call that last slide the staircase of doom. But with Wearscape, what we try and do is we try and blend together as many of these tasks as possible. 
And we can do that with a rich metadata repository over the top of this. What we do is um, we will blend these together so that if I needed to make a change, for example, build something for the first time and subsequently change it, I'm changing the, the target model, the physical model, I'm changing the, um, the code that populates that, that target, and I'm regenerating documentation, all as a single development task. I can also manage workflow, I can manage deployments, I can manage all of these things in one tool with a nice integrated set of metadata to make my life easier in all of the tasks of building a data warehouse. So if the last slide was the staircase of doom, we could call this the elevator of awesomeness. We're gonna to get to deliver our projects a lot better. And that top part, the documentation, that always gets done when we're using Wearscape. Now we actually have two main tools and a bundle of those tools for Data Vault people uh, called Data Vault Express. We have Wearscape 3D and Wearscape Red. Wearscape Red is our primary development tool. That, that manages the development, it manages the operations, it manages the documentation, and it manages the deployment of the data warehouse. And complementary to that, we have Wearscape 3D. Wearscape 3D is more of a design tool. It's a, more of a traditional modeling tool. It stands for data-driven design. And it allows us to reverse engineer a source. It allows us to design a target model. And once we're happy with that target model, we can just push it across into Wearscape Red. So the, the two tools work very nicely together. And when we're building data vaults, we have nice design automation in 3D and we have nice build automation in red to make up Data Vault Express. And this slide really lays out the processing architecture of a data warehouse and the way that we might build it with Wearscape Red. Uh, all of the boxes between the two bookends uh, are tables that are managed in a data warehouse by Wearscape Red. Um, we manage the loading, we manage persistence uh, in the foundation layer, we manage data cleanup, data transformations, business transformations, and end user layer. And Red does all this by creating tables, maybe from an imported design, or maybe just driven from, from the structure of the source data. We apply rules to that data, and we apply rules to that data by generating code. And that code is native SQL to the target platform. So all these boxes are tables. Those tables are existing in a data warehouse platform. It might be Redshift, it might be Snowflake, it might be Azure, it might be SQL Server, Oracle, whatever the target database platform is that you've chosen for your data warehouse. Red has code templates that generate best practice code in the native SQL of that platform. Um, we also have very rich metadata across the bottom. That metadata keeps track of data lineage, keeps track of uh, impact analysis, keeps track of a business glossary, and any other documentation we want to add into the data warehouse. And then on top of that, or fr from that metadata, we can generate documentation. We generate documentation that's compiled into HTML, so we can publish it out across um, to any users of the data warehouse. We also use that metadata for deployment, to deploy between dev, test, and production. And the tool will go, th will uh, walk, a, walk developers or um, system admins through a deployment process that regenerates or generates uh, refactoring DDL for the target uh, environment like uh, test or production. We also have an, an integrated scheduler. So as we need to automate the execution of a, a workflow, a series of tasks, we can define that within the scheduler. Uh, and then we also have this ability to retrofit or import existing designs uh, or existing models from, from a modeling tool. Now that retrofit functionality right at the bottom there is how we're gonna be able to import tables that are built and managed using HVR. And that's what we'll be showing you in the demonstration in a little while. Well, that's my last slide on my introduction to Wearscape. Hopefully that clears up any, uh, any uh, questions about what Wearscape is and what we do. And I'm gonna hand over to Paul to talk about HVR. Thanks, Doug. Sure, so what is HVR? Uh, HVR is high-speed data replication or data integration 
that can move data uh, between two different systems, right? Whether they're database platforms or file systems. Um, we support multiple number of databases, which we'll get into, um, as well as different uh, types of files. Uh, and as well as some common use cases that people typically use when dealing with a change data capture product uh, like HVR. Uh, HVR essentially stands for high volume replication. And just like Wearscape, HVR has been around for about 20 years. Um, it was developed uh, in the Netherlands under Post NL uh, to, and then sold privately and owned by Lufthansa, uh, which handled a lot of the uh, flight and airline reservation systems and flight planning systems. Uh, and then primarily was used for other airlines uh, throughout the world. Um, it wasn't only until about maybe five or six years ago uh, where then HVR, the company, was born to take it public. Uh, but the technology has been around for a while. Uh, and just like uh, Wearscape, uh, there are hundreds of customers uh, for HVR, everywhere from small, medium business SMBs to large enterprise customers like Verizon and Amazon. Uh, I think when it comes to supporting change data capture and data replication, there's many use cases uh, around the world, no matter what type of business you're operating in. Uh, when we take a look at some of the use cases, uh, they range the gambit, right? What's, this technology started about 20 years ago is typically for offloading reporting, right? Any change data capture log-based replication solution uh, was developed for reporting purposes or data warehousing, right? How can I get my data off of my source system uh, onto a system where I can run reports without affecting production, at the same time keeping the overhead low on the source, right? But since then, uh, now it's really broadened into multiple different use cases, right? Not only are we getting into the data warehousing, the reporting, uh, real-time analytics, uh, but now obviously with cloud adoption, moving data from on-prem uh, into the cloud, whether it's AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud, GCP, uh, it becomes a lot easier now with a product like HVR. Um, as we get into the architecture, not only can we do real-time change data capture or data replication between two different systems, but we can also handle the bulk loading of data between them as well. Uh, so essentially helping you establish a target from a live source, whether it's on-prem to on-prem, moving data from on-prem into the cloud, or even cloud to cloud. Uh, the beauty about the architecture is it's very flexible and can be deployed anywhere. Some other use cases get into more of the disaster recovery or high availability, right? If you have geographical distribution where you might be load balancing between two different sites from an application perspective and data replication can be used uh, to move the data in between them from a bi-directional or active-active scenario. And the same thing goes for disaster recovery, right? If you ever need to have a secondary system built in for fault tolerance to be a failover to, having real-time data synced up to that allows for a seamless failover uh, and a quicker recovery time to bring that back up. Lastly, our migrations, right? Uh, whether it's dealing with upgrades on systems uh, or migrating from on-prem into the cloud or even between data centers, moving that data typically takes a long time, right? So having change data capture incorporated with that bulk or initial load allows you to really eliminate the downtime when moving data in between different platforms. And we can talk about that when we get into the architecture. When we look at HVR's architecture, it is a distributed architecture rather than a centralized architecture. And now what does that mean? We are we like to say it's a hub and spoke type of approach, right? With the idea is if you're looking in the industry, you'll hear a lot of industry terms, uh, agent versus agent less. When it comes to replication, we offer both, right? And you might want one over the other, depending on really what use case you're supporting or how much access you have to a particular system. Uh, but I think it all starts in the middle uh, with what we refer to as our HVR hub. Uh, the hub is really just a centralized unit, uh, allow you to really install and configure the software and provide an easy way to, to set up and configure replication in general, right? That's where you would set up essentially your endpoints or your locations that you're connecting to, as well as set up what we refer to as channels or your replication streams, right? Defining where I want to pull my data from or capture my data from and where I want to push my data to. You can set up multiple channels based off of all the locations you set up all on one centralized hub. And the hub can sit on-prem, they can sit in the cloud, uh, it sits on a lightweight machine, uh, whether it's a VM on-prem uh, or whether it's a EC2 or VM in AWS or Azure. Uh, there does, it's not a lot of resources that take up to install and configure that hub. Uh, but once that's installed, then you essentially make your location endpoints or your connections to where you wanna pull data from and push data to. Right? And here's where we have that agent versus agent less approach, right? We can come in uh, 
remotely to make remote calls to APIs to grab the data essentially out of the transaction logs via the agentless approach. Uh, but being in this industry for about 20 years, there's always that constant debate about agent versus agentless. And quite honestly, it's always more, it's always recommended to actually have a local capture process running on the source machine rather than coming remotely through an API call. And that's why we offer both. Uh, not only is it flexible in terms of that architecture, but it's more scalable as well. And how does that work? So from a capture perspective, we're capturing data out of the transaction logs, right? Whether it's Oracle, Redo, and Archive Logs, or SQL Server, DB2, Postgres, MySQL, Transaction Log. And having a native capture process is really a much more efficient way of grabbing the data instead of coming in, uh, outside from a remote call into an API. The reason being is because typically the transaction logs sit outside the database. So that we are not incurring any overhead on the database by our log reading technology. Uh, more importantly, uh, it's more of just a listener process, and not necessarily a full-blown agent. Uh, so with that listener process or capture process, it's not taking up any resources from the OS perspective. Uh, so not only is it having a low overhead on the database, it's low overhead on the system. It's more flexible and more scalable as you deploy that capture process. Uh, I think in addition to that, it provides an efficient and secure way to move data between your source and the HVR hub. And that is because we are compressing and encrypting that data between due to those two different hosts. This is the same as we move towards the delivery side. Uh, we also offer the same concept, right, of agent versus agentless. Uh, but with that agent approach, we can deploy what we refer to as an integrate process or delivery process that would sit on that target machine so that you can compress and encrypt the data between the hub and wherever that target machine might live but more importantly, take advantage of native, native loading technologies to then load that data into the target database, whether we're talking about standard Oracle and SQL Server, or whether we're pushing data up into the cloud uh, when dealing with a Snowflake or Redshift or any of the data warehouse platforms that we support. This also might work uh, when dealing with non-database uh, targets like a Kafka or pushing data into S3, right? We can could take that agent-less approach by pushing right onto a topic within Kafka, or we can have an integrate process running on an EC2 node writing locally to an S3 bucket if you're writing data out into flat files, uh, or of course into Azure blob storage if you're writing into uh, an Azure data lake store. Not only do we support all the databases, which we'll get into, but then of course all the different files, uh, whether you're moving data into flat files like XML files or CSV files, uh, but also if you're pushing into maybe Parquet uh, for loading into S3, or leveraging Avro or JSON when pushing on the Kafka. Uh, really, there is no limitation to how you can move this data between two different systems uh, between the source and the target. Well, once we have that architecture set up, then we take advantage of the three levels of functionality within the product, which are highlighted in blue. Right? First and foremost is that initial load that I mentioned before. Right? Not only being able to move all your data from the source to the target, but creating all your DDL and all your table structures as well. This is really powerful, especially when you're crossing platforms, right? If I'm moving data from Oracle or SQL Server into a Snowflake environment, I might be starting with a blank canvas on the target. Uh, HVR will do all that transformation to convert all those data types from whatever the source might be to help create all the table structures, all your DDL on that target system. Uh, in conjunction with that, we will load all the data as well. Uh, so not only are you creating the tables, but now we can do that bulk initial load between your source and your target. Uh, and company that with the next process, which is the capture and integrate, the CDC, the real-time replication, if you will. And now you can establish your target from a live source, right? Essentially, since we talked about having a distributed architecture and our capture and delivery processes being decoupled, we can now start our capture process from a spe specific point in time uh, or sequence number within the logs to start capturing data in real time and storing it on the hub. Uh, at the same time, the integrate process or delivery process would be down, uh, waiting to receive those changes before pushing it into the target. Uh, the integrate will remain down until we run that refresh or initial load so that we can grab all the data from the source and push it into the target. Uh, it, whether that takes an hour, several hours, or even over 24 hours, uh, we're safe to know that the capture process is still running and you're not incurring any downtime while this process is taking place. So again, that allows you to establish your target from a live source. Once that refresh process stops, then you can release the queue, if you will. The integrate process will reconcile what's already been captured 
uh, with what already has been loaded through that refresh process. So you're not, essentially not loading data twice and it can bring it now in sync with your source. Uh, with that refresh and the capture and integrate, now you can get that target in sync with the source in a real time manner. The last part of that is our compare functionality. And the compare is gonna be your data validation. Uh, and the thing, a great thing about this is again, it not only works like to like, but it works cross platforms. Uh, so you can run that compare between an Oracle and a Snowflake or a Redshift or a SQL Server and a Postgres, whatever the combination, combination of support, uh, source and target there might be, uh, to give you that peace of mind knowing that all your data is in sync. A lot of our customers take advantage of this in multiple different ways. Not only after the initial process to establish that target, uh, but maybe one, run it once a week, once a month, once a quarter. Uh, if you're leveraging that target for data warehousing or reporting, you might want to run that compare just to give you that peace of mind, knowing all the days in sync before you run your month end reports uh, and knowing that's not going to take any additional overhead on the systems. Uh, with the great thing about compare is it's doing a hash level compare at the table level first to determine how that data is going to remain in sync. Uh, it can also handle what we call online compare, which means even if there's transactions in flight and the systems are live, we will still be able to run a compare process to, to ensure that that data is going to be in sync at any given point in time. Just to talk about some of the broad platform support, uh, I know I mentioned a lot of these already. Uh, you can see the sources listed on the left, uh, where they are, their standard database platforms uh, like Postgres or SQL Server, Oracle or DB2, uh, but also getting into uh, some other sources, uh, things like pulling data from Salesforce, for instance, right? Now that, uh, you know, when I first started 20 years ago with Shareplex, uh, we were talking about Siebel Systems and PeopleSoft. Uh, and now it seems it's all about Salesforce and Workforce Now and, and Workday. Uh, and it really just grabbing all that data now uh, is coming from different sources than what we traditionally look at from a standard application and database. So being able to pull data from Salesforce and push it into a target system, whether it's going to be a data warehouse uh, or another database, per se, for reporting, uh, we really brought in the support uh, for what we can capture data from and deliver data to. Uh, on the right side, you'll see a much more extensive list, um, obviously because we deliver data to more platforms than we can capture. For instance, like a Teradata, some of these platforms that do not have log structures, like the data warehouses, such as a Greenplum or Teradata, things like that. Um, but also we can push data into MongoDB, Cassandra, and even that flat file format that I mentioned before, whether it's going to be in a Parquet format on S3 or leveraging JSON and Avro for Kafka. Another thing to note, if you are an SAP shop, we do support SAP in a couple of different applications. Uh, if you're leveraging ECC, we do handle the pool and cluster tables. Uh, we have an SAP transform process that will unpack those so we can support the entire application from SAP. Uh, as well as if you've leveraged HANA, we are the only log-based capture or extraction tool for HANA on the market today. Uh, so HVR really concentrates hard on making sure that we have the best platform support, no matter where we're capturing from or delivering data to. Some of the data warehouse platforms that we've already talked about, right? Snowflake, we see a lot more of now, right? Where it used to be the Teradata and the green plums of the world, now people are pushing their data up into the cloud in which case we're seeing the Snowflake, the Azure SQL Data Warehouse and Redshift. Uh, Snowflake now is on both AWS as well as Azure, and I don't think they're too far behind from getting onto GCP. Uh, we have a really great partnership with them, just like we do with Wearscape. Uh, so leveraging uh, HVR to move that data in and provide real-time data integration or data replication into Snowflake is something that is pretty common within HVR. And I think to sum it all up, right, the, the partnership between Wearscape and HVR has been great, right? Because now you can take advantage of a lot more use cases, right? Obviously faster decisions uh, because now we're handling transactional consistent data, real-time replicated data, change data capture into your target systems. Uh, you're gonna eliminate essentially the batch windows associated with that, right? If you've ever leveraged an Informatica or an Abbey Initio or any ETL tool, they're great for transforming that data, uh, but your batch windows start to shrink on some of these source machines, uh, given the fact that most of these applications are now 24 by seven by 365. Uh, so you really don't have that window to leverage an ETL tool to grab that data. And so having a low, low overhead, lightweight change data capture solution has really eliminated that problem. And the last thing is really just the combination of Wearscape and 
HVR for optimized processing, right? Now you can leverage real-time data into loading or staging tables and then have Warescape do their thing to convert it into a star schema, right? So if you're pulling data from a transactional system uh, and pushing it into more of a data warehouse, you, you're definitely gonna probably take advantage of more different star schemas. And that's essentially where the partnership has really been great between HVR and Warescape. And now I'll turn it back over to Doug uh, to complete the presentation and get into a demo. Awesome, thanks, Paul. Yeah, so um, you know, the combination of the two together, you know, we're uh, HVR can bring that data in, synchronize the data in from source systems, source applications, files, whatnot, bring it and land it into the data warehouse, into a staging area or a persisted staging area, like um, what we would call a data store area. And that eliminates the Wearscape having to manage that load process and do micro batches where we've only got really access to the data, whereas HVR gives us access to the infrastructure, the data infrastructure of the source to pull the data in, synchronize that data in. So um, the two tools work really nicely together. That brings the raw data in. We don't have to worry about uh, latency. It's all being managed, monitored, compared by HVR. And then we can apply the transforms in the target platform using Wearscape. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over and, and show you what that might look like in, uh, in a Wearscape environment. So here I've, uh, I've just opened up Wearscape Red. Um, and I've, for a bit of drama, I've renamed one of our object types to be HVR objects. Now in my environment, there's a bunch of tables that already exist. It's, it's as if uh, an HVR person came in, uh, set up replication between a source environment and my data warehouse. And now I've got a bunch of tables sitting in my target environment in a staging area. And I want to bring that into Wearscape Red. Now, um, one of my slides earlier, I mentioned we would use the retro option, the retrofit option. That allows me to go out and pull in a bunch of tables that already exist into into Red's metadata. So within my data warehouse, I've got this HVR schema, and I'm going to push this into an HVR target. Now, in actual fact, all I'm doing is I'm just saying that we've already defined an HVR target that actually matches that schema. But what this process is going to do is it's going to read the structure of all the tables that HVR has created for us. Uh, and so Red's read in the structure of all these tables. Now, Wearscape Red will try and assign a, um, an object type, a target type. Now, this is often, we could be loading in stage tables, dimension tables, fact tables. In this case, they're all the same target type. So I can just select all of these tables. And I can say, right, convert these to the target object type that it's, it's kind of figured out based on the naming pattern of, of this process. So now we have all these tables and they're imported. So we've got the data in there. The data is being managed by HVR. We don't have to worry about the load process. Now we can use these tables like we would normally within Wearscape. We can come here and we can say, well, let's build some processing where I'm going to take my uh, data warehouse uh, or my HVR tables. Let's come here, my HVR tables, and let's create a staging table. And this staging table, we want to do some, some work to it. I'm going to define it based on the products table. And I'm also going to add in some attributes from, say, uh, this related categories table. So we're going to go through a process of denormalization, which is a very common pattern within data warehouse processing. I'm going to denormalize this data so that we've got uh, the relevant information pulled together to make it easier to analyze this data. And Westscape's really good at allowing me to make changes to, to this, apply transforms, rename things. Here, I'm just going to add in a description. And I could come here and I could say, right, I want to make this and give it a function. So I'm going to use a function. And it really depends on what my target platform is as to what the function library I get is. Uh, in this case, I'm just using SQL Server. So I could come here and I could say, well, let's use the upper function and just make sure the supplier name is in, um, in capitals. But I can access any of the, the features and functionality of 
at the target platform. Once I've done that, then I can create the table and I can create the code to populate that table and apply those transforms for me. And now, because we pulled together uh, that denormalization, I can come through here and just specify, well, how do we join that data back together? I'm going to use a, a left join between the products and the suppliers. And then I'm going to um, do a left join again between the, uh, the categories. And that's built me some SQL that we can go off and we can run. And we can look at the results. Okay, so that's now denormalized that data. We can see here that we have our supplier name, uh, all capitals based on that transform. Uh, we have our category name, and we have all the other attributes of products. And maybe I've done some preparation in this case to now publish to a dimension table. So now I can come here and I can say, well, let's take the data from our staging area and create a dimension table. And here we're going to walk through again some patterns. Is this a type one dimension, a type two dimension, a type three, or something more cunning? And in this case, I'm going to go for a type two dimension. And you can see in the background, uh, the automation process has added a surrogate key because it's a dimension table. We know that that's a common design pattern. Uh, I can customize the naming pattern of that. It's also added a start date, an end date, a current flag, a version number, create and update, some housekeeping columns that we know are common for type two dimensions. And now I'm just gonna build the code to populate this table. I'm gonna identify the a business key of this data product ID, because we hadn't previously identified what uniquely identifies a, uh, a product. And now I'm going to identify what my uh, change columns are, my type two columns, uh, all the other stuff I'm just gonna overwrite. And what this is gonna do is it's going to create some code for me, it's gonna create a table for me, and it's built for me. Uh, it's very, very rapid. Now, if I wanted to make a change, let's just drop a couple of columns, let's reorder level and, and discontinued. Let's drop a couple of columns. I can come in here and say, right, well, let's get rid of this reorder level. Don't need that in my dimension. Units on order, let's delete that. And units in stock, let's delete, uh, well, not duplicate, let's delete it. And now I can just say, well, let's have a look at what that would look like with that change being applied. And so here we can see that we're gonna recreate the table, regenerate the code, run it, and look at the results. We get a unit test very, very rapidly. And that looks much cleaner on the end of my table. I can see my start date and end date being managed for me if there was any changes to come through from the replication process. So I can build tables, I can build code. Another aspect of this though is the rich metadata. I can do a track back diagram. It's gonna show me the data lineage of the process I just built to dim products. Where did the data come from? We can see our denormalization process here. And I can double click in here and, and see the code that we generated underneath the covers uh, based on our inputs into the dialogues. Now all this metadata we can compile into documentation. So here I'm just going to create documentation. And this is gonna compile that metadata into HTML so that we've got access to it, even if we're not using the tool. If I want to expose this to a wider audience, they can just come to that place where I just outputted the documentation uh, and see it in their browser. So for example, we can describe the end user layer of the data warehouse, in this case, star schema. We can add in descriptive information. You saw me add descriptive information to our products dimension. But I only added one one description to that um, products dimension. Uh, and so this is really exposing the data dictionary. I can import that data dictionary if I wanted to from some other source. We've got a glossary of the end user layer. Then we also have documentation that's intended for a different audience, one that's intended for a technical audience, one that needs to know how something was built. So in this case, how did we build our, our products dimension that we just built? What are the steps we went through? If we come back to the stage table, we want to see any transforms that are applied to the data. 
we might even want to dive into the actual code and see the code that was generated, in this case for SQL Server, so it's SQL Server code templates that we've used. Uh, but if this was um, Snowflake, if this was Redshift, if this was Azure, we would see the code that is specific to those different platforms. Okay, so that is a very brief demonstration of how we would import the tables managed by HVR into Wearscape, and then how we could use that to then build out business processing, the denormalization, the derivation, perhaps the data cleanup that's required um, as we build out the business layer of a data warehouse. So I'm gonna flick back to our presentation there. Uh, I'll let Paul talk to uh, this one. Yes, thanks, Doug. Uh, so I think in summary, right, having the two HVR and Wearscape uh, are both comprehensive and efficient as we build out a data warehouse, right? First and foremost, a streamlined approach uh, for not only delivering the data, but then modeling it in a way that makes sense for the data warehouse and taking into account all the different features and functions that we went through, right? Starting with your initial loads and creating all the target structures, uh, leveraging that in conjunction with the change data capture to create your target from a live source, uh, and then getting into really being able to leverage the Wearscape uh, to quickly design, develop, deploy, and operate into that data warehousing uh, within days rather than weeks or months. Uh, and then of course, once this is all in place, leveraging the right monitoring and documentation to make sure everything is working properly, right? The couple things that we did not discuss but are available in HVR is really just leveraging your performance statistics as you're moving this data into your target system, right? We'll overlay your latency uh, with this, or report on your latency, both from a capture and delivery perspective, and then overlay that on top of other performance metrics broken down by how many inserts, updates, deletes are flowing through the system. Uh, but more importantly, taking it one step further into breaking it down per table, right? So now I can see if my latency does tend to climb or seem to climb on my target system to about 10 minutes, I can quickly identify who, which, who the culprit is essentially, right? If I'm operating a large batch operation or an update to one particular table, I can see that in real time, right? And now with the beauty of HVR's architecture, we can capture ones, deliver many. I can separate that table out into its separate delivery process so that it wouldn't affect other tables involved in replication, right? This is really important when leveraging a data warehouse like Snowflake or Redshift or any data warehouse that is not designed for OLTP like a SQL Server or Oracle, right? Having that distributed architecture that we went over allows us to support multiple topologies like a capture once, deliver many. So having one capture process reading from the source, but delivering that data into multiple threads on the target so that you can get that data in in a timely manner. I think at this point, uh, that is the end of the presentation. I think we can open it up for questions, unless Doug had other things that he need to go through. No, I think we're all done. Let's, uh, let's answer some questions. All right, I'm back. Thank you, Doug and Paul. Really informative, and thank you for working um, us through how the, the, about the value in HVR and Wearscape delivers. And also, thank you to the audience. A lot of questions out there. So I'm going to try to get to many of them today. If not, we will have one of our team members follow up. So again, thank you for the questions. And if you have a question, feel free to type it into your question box. Just going to get to the first question that I probably should have covered in the beginning was, is, was this, is this recorded? Yes, it is. And a copy will be delivered to you post-presentation. So I'm going to dive into some technical questions. Paul, this one's for you. Um, this is from Lawrence out there. Hi, Lawrence. So his question is, for the compare action, if the source data does not contain a hash key, is the hash generated on the fly based on the primary keys for the table it is comparing? Yes. Uh, so the way that our compare works is we generate the hash key for you based off of uh, the table level, right? Um, so there's two levels of granularity. First, the bulk granularity does a hash at the table level to determine if there's any data out of sync. Uh, if there is any discrepancies, uh, then we can take it one step further and do a row by row granularity, in which case we will run a hash at the row level. Uh, this is independent of whether the, the column or the table has a 
has a hash key or not. Uh, we will pick the primary key. Otherwise, if there are is no primary key, we we log all columns as a primary key. Uh, so to answer your question, it's done through HVR, and yes, we can support tables with or without primary keys. Great, thanks, Paul. Now this question, I believe Doug may have touched on a part um, during his demo, but there was a question about uh, is any metadata shared between HVR and Wearscape? Maybe Doug, you can take this one, or both of you. Right. Yeah, right now um, there is little additional metadata beyond the structure of the tables. So that's really what we're importing into Wearscape's metadata. Now we can, of course, enrich that um, you know, manually by saying, hey, this is HVR managed and, and we can add in other um, placeholders, there's placeholders for documentation within Wearscape's metadata. But as the partnership develops, this of course would be um, a, a place where we're going to add in metadata automatically from, from HVR whether it be you know, where the data source is sourced from, um, you know, where does it come from, what frequency, and any other relevant information that we can glean from HVR from their metadata, pull it into Wearscape so that the Wearscape documentation contains that for the, uh, for the technical documentation. Um, that, that's on the roadmap, but right now um, uh, we're just pulling in the table definitions. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so a question out there from Stephen. Hi, Stephen. He's asking, and this is for you, Doug, can the Wearscape Data Dictionary information be exported to third-party data catalogs? Yes, yes, it can. So we can export metadata from our metadata repository. We can export it to a CSV file, the, the, the business catalog or the data dictionary. Um, but we can also query uh, through a series of views that metadata directly from the metadata tables themselves. Um, so yes, yes, we can work nicely with other metadata tools. Fantastic. And then another one we have is from Bob. Bob, thanks for all your questions. Some of those we may have to follow up with after the fact, but the question you asked I think is uh, important for everyone here on the call to hear is, an earlier slide mentioned a real-time data warehouse. How is that possible using these tools? Paul, would you mind taking this one first? I'm sorry, I, you broke up a little bit there. Um, Meredith, sure. would you mind it? Sure, an earlier slide had mentioned a real-time data warehouse. How is that possible using these tools? So I think, and that might have come earlier in the presentation, which we might have already answered, but essentially a real-time data warehouse is, is leveraged uh, by first having HVR, have a real-time change data capture against your source, uh, no matter what that source might be, whether it's an Oracle system, a SQL Server, Postgres, what have you, uh, and moving those data, uh, moving that data in real time to the data warehouse or your target uh, for then either to remain as is uh, or have Wearscape pick it up uh, to push it into a star schema. So uh, it's really this change data capture of HVR that's leveraging that real-time data delivery into the data warehouse. That's right. And then once uh, HVR delivers that data or synchronizes that data in that sort of persistent area of the data warehouse, we can have micro batches or streams within some platforms to support streams and, and tasks built into the platform itself to then move that data, ripple that data through. The nice thing about that, though, is that HVR can mark when the data was last updated. So it's tracking changes, synchronizes changes, but it's tracking that it's, it's, um, it's adding a last updated column to the data, which means we can do very efficient micro batches through any subsequent uh, data warehouse business layer. So real time, maybe not, but near real time, sort of minute latency um, is possible using this approach. Great, thank you, Doug and Paul. Here's a question about data faults. Um, this is from Brent. Hi, Brent. How would this approach be leveraged in a data vault environment? Would the load and stage areas be transient or would they have to be persistent? Um, in, in this case, the, it doesn't really matter. They could be um, persisted. So the raw data, the, the raw data is managed by HVR, probably persisted, uh, probably keep the, the raw data there. And then the, the Wearscape processing can apply the data vault standards to that data, add hash keys, change keys, publish that to uh, a data vault structure. 
and then on, on into a business fault and information mark on top of that. So all the processing patterns thereafter from the raw data. But probably a persisted raw uh, data set managed by HVR as part of that, that solution. Great. Paul, did you want to add to that or you feel that was covered? No, I think that was covers it all for that question. We don't do anything. Okay, great. Yep. That's what I thought. Great. Uh, so, um, Doug, a question uh, here is about the scalability of Wearscape. Is it scalable and how many records can Wearscape handle? Ah, oh, that's a very good question. Well, um, Wearscape's going to leverage the, the target platform, Snowflake or Teradata or SQL Server. So really it's a question of the scalability of that platform. And we've got customers that have enormous multi-petabyte data warehouses built and managed entirely using Wearscape. Uh, so it's really whether the platform on which we're building that data warehouse can cope with that multi-petabyte data set. And we're loading terabytes of data in. Again, it's to do with more of the infrastructure rather than the tool. Our tool, Wearscape, is going to generate native code to leverage the, the platform uh, to its entirety. Great. Thanks, Doug. Here's a question from for both of you from Kevin. Hello, Kevin. So how do both HVR and Wearscape support deploying a temporal data warehouse? Well, temporal data warehouse is one where the, the sort of the, the source environment, the, the native environment, the target platform uh, is managing or identifying when data changes. Uh, and that's a can be a good thing, can be a bad thing operationally. You know, in data warehousing, traditionally, you want control over the management of when data changes. But with real-time data warehousing, we can make much more use of a temporal database. So um, it, using this real-time approach of, of synchronization and then processing through the layers, this becomes a real um, possibility, make it a, a much more realistic thing to, to manage using the, the, the native temporal capabilities of the database. Excellent. Yeah, All right. I, that, Go that, ahead, Paul. No, I think there's nothing to add on that one too. That's going to be more of a Wearscape question than an HVR question. Great. So that concludes the Q&A session of this webinar. And actually, we're at the end of today's webinar. Please, again, if we did not cover your question, we will have someone follow up. And thank you all for your great questions, your interest and participation today. If you would like to have someone from HVR or Wearscape reach out to you, please type yes in the question box. And we will have someone follow up to talk about the solutions or perhaps your use case and how our joint solutions can help you with your use case. Um, again, I'll leave you a couple of minutes or a moment to type in yes, and then we will conclude the webinar. Paul and Doug, thank you very much for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us today. I appreciate it, and thanks for your time. No worries. All right, thank you, everyone.